One of the most popular aspects of ethnobotany is the study of medicinal plants. Uh, and medicinal plants are all around us. There's lots of different species. They're used in just about every culture around the world unless it's people who live in an extreme arctic condition where they just don't have very many plants. However, if we want to look at medicinal plants, we actually have to first take a step backwards and look at the context in which medicinal plants are used. And this context consists of several really important aspects. The first of these is that there's a set of cultural beliefs about illness and health care. These are beliefs that people hold about why people might become unhealthy and what it actually means to be healthy. And as it turns out, these concepts are not the same across different cultures. But each culture has their own variation on the way they approach this. And the reason this is important for the study of medicinal plants is that understandings of illness and health directly lead to decisions about what kinds of plants might be useful for healthcare and how to use them. And so what we want to first do is let's explore a little bit about uh, how cultures perceive illness. Illness, health, medicine, and other related terms are all culturally defined. Although we have scientific definitions for each of these, these definitions are not universals even within our own society. The terms tend to be consistent within a particular culture, and in fact we could define a culture by being that group of people that hold these terms to have about the same meaning. But there's a great deal of inconsistency in the, in the definition of these terms between cultures. So the idea of illness across a range of cultures is not going to be consistent. The idea of what health is across a range of cultures will not be consistent. The idea of what a medicine is and how it should work within a human is not consistent across cultures. Before studying and attempting to understand medicinal plants, one must study and attempt to understand the cultural context in which plants are used. And this is really the key concept of this presentation. Within our society, there's often a discussion of uh, standard medicine or traditional medicine or allopathic medicine which is oftentimes also labeled as Western medicine, and a contrasting term, which is alternative medicine. The implication from this kind of uh, conversation is that there's a dichotomy, that there are two kinds of health care. Well, the simple fact of the matter is, is that there's not two kinds of health care. There's a large number of kinds of health care out there. In fact, there's probably more than one health care system per culture or language on Earth. The implication would be that there are literally thousands of healthcare systems available on the earth. So in order to think about this, first what we need to do is let's think about this term western that gets thrown around a lot. Uh, this is a term that's really used to try to lump people together. It's oftentimes used as a derogatory term. Well, that's kind of a western idea, somebody might say. Or, well that's western medicine, I don't really hold to that. If we look at the origin of the term, uh, this can refer to several different kinds of things. It may refer to so-called Western civilization, that being the Western half of the Roman Empire, the part that was ruled by Rome after the division of the two halves, with Constantinople ruling the Eastern half of the empire. So therefore, Western culture would be all of those civilizations that were under the Romans at that time. And this would have been much of what's referred to as Western Europe. Alternatively, Western culture is oftentimes discussed as being all of the cultural ideas that are descended from and intertwined with the history of the Greeks. And so Greek civilization is purported to be the foundation of Western culture. And so the idea is that all people who would practice a Western lifestyle are descended from a Greek perspective of the world. Within this, there's the idea of Western thought. And Western thought most commonly is equated with Christianity and the idea that uh, Christian thinking 
uh, is somehow the Western thought pattern. Well, the problem with all of these is that they're very sloppy and they tend to homogenize a great deal of cultural diversity. So let's just think for a second. If somebody comes from Portugal, so they'd say they're Portuguese, and somebody else comes from Germany, and a third person comes from Greece, would we say that these people all have the same culture, that they have the same traditional background? They don't even have the same language. Well, no, of course we wouldn't say that. That's crazy. But that's exactly what happens when we use a term lumping like Western. So therefore, it's probably a good idea to just ditch this idea of using the term Western and stick with something that's a little more accurate, um, that more clearly describes what we're talking about. So in conclusion, the term Western is really racially biased. It's poorly defined, and it turns out that this is often uh, used in a prejudicial way, a way to denigrate one particular group of people or another. And so we're going to try to not use this word Western. So we're not going to talk about Western medicine. Instead, we're going to talk about, we're going to use the term globalized medicine to refer to the healthcare system that we find dominating the world scene today. That's largely based upon the use of pharmaceuticals and physicians who have gone through, gone through a fairly modern medical school training. Uh, and this globalized medicine is actually found in just about every country around the world. Um, and, and there is some homogeneity in both the terminology that's used by the practitioners and in the understandings of the way diseases come about and are effectively treated. So we're going to pit globalized medicine against individual medicinal systems rather than discussing Western medicine. So we can see that in, when we're talking about medicine that there's not just two cultural possibilities, that being Western and non-Western. Um, there's, there's a, a range of other terms that get drug into this discussion as well. One of them is allopathic, which refers to kind of this globalized medicine, sort of. Another is alternative medicine that generally lumps together uh, a sweep of the landscape of most other cultural practices. Um, however, each culture may have multiple options available to them. Even within the civilizations of Europe, there's not just one type of medicine that's practiced. In fact, there's a large number of traditional medicinal practices that we find in different European nations. So uh, this term Western can not only be jettisoned, but we can stomp up and down on it and say this is really just a dumb idea. So if we look at medicinal systems as being part of people's worldview, uh, we can see that there's several aspects to think about. First is that each medicinal system is part of a complete worldview or paradigm. And this paradigm explains how the world works and why it works the way it does, and even how it works. And within a particular worldview, we tend to have a consistency of the terms that are used, the ideas that are expressed, and the kind of logic that's used to connect all of these pieces together. In addition, a paradigm or a worldview has a level of predictability about it, meaning that once you understand how the mechanisms work and you understand the logic of that system, you can predict how a particular pattern is going to occur. So if, if I'm using a particular healing system and I understand the logic of how it works and I want to treat a patient, I can encounter a disease that I've never seen before, apply the logic of that healing tradition and come out with a remedy that I may have never used before but that makes sense within that healing system. And this is one of the powerful things about stepping back and looking at the overall structure before we dive into looking at the medicinal plants. Because the logic of selecting those plants did not really arrive from the plants themselves, but rather it arrived from that logic that the culture holds. However, there are some broad differences that we can see across the range of cultural systems. And these can be found in four main categories. The first is how different healers are educated. The second is how remedies are selected. The third is how remedies are applied. And the fourth is how people determine that they've had a successful treatment. Because as it turns out, a successful treatment is not necessarily the same. And this may seem kind of funny, uh, but it's actually much more complex than what it first appeared. So some of the ways that the education of healers is variable across systems is that in some systems of healthcare, 
healers are trained by only their relatives and so you have knowledge systems that descend within families. In fact, this is probably the most common system around the world, is where an individual healer will learn from an elder relative. Now, we also have systems that have formalized schools of training, where a younger person will realize or be selected to become a healer, and they will then go and study either under a master healer or in some other kind of formalized setting where they learn uh, a healing tradition. Uh, probably the uh, globalized medicinal system functions pretty much this way most of the time. We also have some hybrids where there's knowledge that's being passed partly through a familial system and partly through a formalized system. And then we have some other systems that are, in, that are written where individuals study written materials and memorize large volumes of uh, written text and then from that memorization they now know how to follow the healing tradition. And many of the traditions of South Asia fit into this particular pattern. The selection of remedies varies pretty broadly across cultures in that the, once a disease is diagnosed, uh, in some traditions the simple diagnosis immediately leads to the selection of a remedy. In other cases, additional steps are needed and these steps could involve uh, consulting spiritual authorities, they could involve um, uh, studying the patient in some other way, or they could involve doing experimentation on the patient to figure out what is the appropriate remedy. There's a lot of variation in how you select a remedy. The application of remedies varies a lot, and people in different societies have an expectation of what is an, uh, an appropriate remedy. So, for instance, um, when I worked as a pharmacist, um, if I came out to a patient and I gave them a bottle of pills and said take one of these three times a day for 10 days, that would seem like a normal kind of treatment for them. However, if I came out to them and I handed them a box of suppositories and said you need to insert one of these rectally five times a day for the next 10 days, uh, they would look at me and say, you want me to stick that where? Why don't you do that? So, in our society, that's not really considered to be a normal way to receive medicines. However, in some parts of Europe, the cultural tradition is to use suppositories, and if the pharmacist recommended that a patient use a suppository, they would probably feel that that was a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Likewise, my experience in Polynesia has been that many Polynesian healers, particularly in parts of Western Polynesia, will massage the patients as part of the remedy. So they may prepare a drink that is taken internally and then that same concoction is also massaged onto the patient. Oftentimes a patient will not feel that they've been effectively treated unless there was some form of massage that accompanied the treatment. And so the whole application process varies across cultures and each culture has some ideas about what is appropriate and what's inappropriate. And then lastly the determination of a successful treatment is variable and it would seem like uh, this is a pretty straightforward thing. You're either healthy or you're not. But it's not that simple. Uh, a few years ago I was working in a community and I was recording remedies uh, that a group of women were, were using. And one of the remedies they told me about was a treatment for hiccups. And they said, well, if you have a baby and the baby um, gets hiccups, then this is the treatment you give and you put these plants together and you give it to the baby and, and then the baby will be better. And so I said, okay, that's great. And uh, as part of my record, I always ask the question, how do you know that the person is better? And the answer that I got in this case was, well, the baby will start hiccuping again. And I thought about it for a minute. And I said, something doesn't sound quite right. And I said, maybe you need to explain this to me again. And so she walked through the process again. And she says, well, you know that a baby has a problem when they're hiccuping and then they suddenly stop hiccuping. You need to give them a medication to make sure that they start hiccuping again. Because in that society, if you stop doing anything suddenly, it's very bad. You want things to gradually ease off. And so a baby who's hiccuping is actually okay, but it's if they suddenly stop, this is a very bad thing. All things should be brought on slowly and they should be brought to a resolution slowly. So they would give the baby a remedy that would cause it to start hiccuping again and therefore you know, be able to slowly resolve the hiccuping. 
Now obviously, in, in my society, if I gave somebody a remedy that would cause them to hiccup, they would not consider that to be an effective remedy. But in this other culture, that is an effective remedy. And so we have to realize that the kinds of efficacy uh, that people expect are different. Just to give another example to be really clear on this. Uh, one pattern of variation that we see across cultures uh, that tends to be polarized is there are some cultures where if you have an upset stomach, the appropriate treatment is something that soothes it and settles it. You'll see advertisements for Pepto-Bismol that talk about soothing and calming. That is something that's culturally acceptable and appropriate in American society today. However, there's a large number of cultures where the appropriate treatment of an upset stomach is to clean out your stomach. And so a remedy would be given that would cause you to throw up, either to evacuate your bowels out the bottom end or to throw up out the top end. But, and that would be considered to be an effective remedy. If you had an upset stomach and you tried to calm it, that would be looked at as a very poor remedy. So, once again, the expectation of a culture directly relates to what kind of a remedy can and should be used. And so trying to pull a remedy out of one society and poke it into another one is sometimes a dicey affair. Anthropologists often discuss uh, different theories about sickness and healing, and they tend to discuss them within three broad categories. And so we want to take a little bit of time now to think about these different categories. The first of these is a theory that uh, illness and uh, remedies are developed along uh, environmental or evolutionary lines, meaning that there's an evolutionary component that relates to how and why people are sick or healthy. The second is a culture-based theory, that cultural systems drive what happens. The third is that there's a political or an economic basis for healthcare systems. In an environmental theory, uh, the focus is upon the interplay between the environment and adaptive evolution of each culture. So what this means is that each culture is engaged in a very Darwinian interaction with the environment where people are experimenting with plants, they're experiencing diseases, and they're putting these two pieces together and coming up with remedies that tend to be more and more effective over time. And the remedies are directly related to the types of ailments that they encounter in the specific environment where they're living. The principal determinants of sickness and healing in this are human adaptations. So this is an evolutionary strategy. Human adaptations to a specific environment result in development of medicines or other healthcare treatments. Uh, this is taken to some extremes. We have uh, examples such as sociobiology, um, and we can look at this, we can, we can look at an evolutionary model as having three different aspects. There can be an, a reductionistic approach to it, wherein the, the analysis of the way in which the environment is interacting with people, creating remedies, can be reduced down to just a few principal components. And we tend to forget about the complexity of the environment and the complexity of culture. There's an emergism philosophy within this, where we can say that uh, there are elements of the environment and elements of culture that are interacting with each other in a complex way, and emergent features come out of the system that are the healthcare system, and that it's from within a complex system that we have a, uh, a healthcare system develop. And that's what we're really looking at when we're studying a healthcare system. And then there's an interactionist approach, where we say all of this is really the result of interactions between the environment and culture, and the evolution is actually happening at the level of the interactions, and that what we're really focusing on is that simple kind of interaction between the people and the environment, and it's nothing more complex than that. With a cultural theory, the, the focus is really on the cultural system itself, that pre-existing set of beliefs and ideas that a people have. So people could have developed their culture in any particular environment, moved to a new environment, and the environment around them is not going to have a strong impact on their beliefs. Their beliefs 
are still their beliefs and they don't change a lot through time. And the idea here is that irregardless of the feedback you get from the environment, your cultural beliefs about the way the environment works and why it works that way are overriding and are far more important in the decision-making process about how people become ill, how they should be effectively treated, and why a certain medicinal plant might work. And so uh, a cultural perspective kind of comes from a different angle. From a cultural theory perspective, the principal determinants of sickness and healing processes are pre-existing cultural beliefs. And so it's not the environment that's dictating how people think about the uh, sickness and how they determine healthcare procedures. It's their belief systems. Once again, we can have a reductionist and emergist and, and interactionist perspective on this, where one would look at the simple, uh, simple sets of relationships, one would look at the emergent properties that come out of complexity, and the other would focus just on the basic interactions. The third example that we have is a, a political or an economic theory. And this can really be thought of as a Marxist analysis of a healthcare system. Within this, the focus is on uh, power or ownership and the control of social interactions with the environment. Uh, the idea here is basically that uh, people who are in power, people who have wealth, are able to control their environment around them and therefore are able to mitigate disease effects and maintain a high level of health. And people who do not have wealth and are not able to control the environment around them are more susceptible to illness and are basically uh, under the control of the environment around them. And, but it's all because of their economic status or their political status. And so within a, uh, a political or an economic theory, the principal determinants of sickness and healing processes are really the cultural economic organizations. So we can imagine a system where you have a chiefly structure. Uh, within this, the, those who are the chiefs, the highest chiefs in particular, are the least likely to be unhealthy, and they're also the most likely to be the individuals who are the mediators of health care. Uh, the opposite would be true of the people who are at the lowest station in, in society. These individuals are the most likely to have ill health and the least likely to be the healers within their society. Once again, we could examine these by using a reductionistic approach, by looking at the emergent features, or by fo focusing on the categories of interactions that occur. So let's, let's consider sicknesses or illnesses within cultures and some of the kinds of variation that we see. Well, the, the first kinds of variation that we see are in the areas where people would say, yeah, this is a source of a particular illness, or the presence of, of something is maintains an illness, keeps it there, such that uh, if you either remove the source, you wouldn't get sick in the first place, or if you removed whatever that cause is, you would stop being ill, stop being sick. So the first of these is the biological environment. And we have several different elements of the biological environment that are uh, thought to contribute to illness. These can include pathogens such as bacteria uh, or other kinds of things that are in the environment that can cause disease, allergens, uh, pollen, things like that, and toxins, uh, chemicals that are in the environment that can cause you to have an allergic reaction. Uh, secondly, we have some elements of the non-biological environment that contribute to illness. Uh, these include atmospheric conditions. People will say that during the winter they're more likely to get sick than in the summer, uh, or there may be other aspects. People may become ill because there was a lightning storm. There's lots of different reasons that are related to atmospheric conditions. The location and the types of conditions of that location. This could involve both altitude and latitude, so we'll talk about altitude sickness, or it could be uh, uh, people getting sick flying, uh, lots of different things that relate to your location and the conditions of that location. And we have some illnesses that are related to geological conditions. Here in Hawaii, people may get sick because of fog, which is volcanic ash in the air. And uh, there's lots of other kinds of geological conditions. Some people may uh, suffer an illness because of an earthquake that occurs or something like that. Uh, we also have illnesses that are related to the cultural environment around us. Uh, some of these include recognition of different kinds of phenomena, 
and cosmological placement. Those of you who follow your horoscope, and every once in a while you'll see that your horoscope says, oh, this is not a good time to do such and such, that's saying that if you did that, you might become ill. That's a cosmological uh, interpretation of illness. Recognition of phenomena can come about when you see something happen and you say, oh, that's going to lead to illness. And this could be everything from a black cat walking in front of you to walking under a ladder or something like this, uh, where your cultural belief is that when a certain phenomena happens, it will lead to something bad happening. Sometimes these are referred to as bad luck, but other times these are discussed directly as relating to health and wellness. We have, a, we have a kind of an odd issue of granted or acquired control. And what this really means is that in many cultural situations, an individual will grant control over their life to somebody else. Uh, we have uh, a number of kinds of, uh, kind of complex social illnesses that occur within our own society where a mother will tell her child that the child is ill. And over time, the child will believe that they are chronically ill, when in fact it turns out the child really isn't ill. But the child believes what their mother says, and so the child is ill. And that's really uh, granted or acquired control. Sometimes we have uh, mass movements where there will be a leader who tells people that they are ill or unhealthy uh, or have something wrong with them. And because of the charisma of this individual, the group believes that that is the case, and they follow the guidance of that individual. That's really granted or acquired control that's from a cultural level. Uh, nocebo and placebo expectations um, and the roles of faith are pretty complex, um, and they're also very common. We frequently discuss the idea of a placebo. This is where you, uh, you receive something and somebody tells you this is a really good medication and it's going to work for you just fine, and, and you go away happy. Uh, I, I have some examples of this from my own work as a pharmacist where we would have a physician who asked us to give a placebo to a patient. Uh, we would usually give them some kind of an inert tablet and tell them, you know, you need to take this three times a day, uh, you need to, you know, watch your diet, and we would give them some generalized directions that would be good with any medication. And I've had patients come in and say, wow, this stuff worked great. And whereas in the back of my head, I'm thinking they received nothing. But their mind told them that it worked, and it worked. And for one reason or another, a placebo can sometimes be effective. And so we often talk about the placebo effect, which is the effect that you get from a, a, a non-biologically uh, non active substance. There's also a nocebo effect, and this is kind of the opposite. This is where, with a placebo, you believe something good is going to happen, and then it happens. A nocebo effect is when you believe something bad is going to happen, and then it happens. We have quite a lot of these. Uh, somebody might give somebody else the evil eye, and they think something bad is going to happen, and then it does. Uh, a, the classic example of this is a uh, voodoo practitioner um, telling somebody that they will make them into a zombie, and then this person uh, uh, undergoes a death experience. The voodoo practitioner brings them out of that and keeps them in a lightly drugged state, and they believe from then on that they are a zombie, that they are somebody who's been dead and brought back to life. And that's a nocebo effect. You believe something bad will happen, and then it does. Uh, there's a, a couple of classic studies of people who were told by their physician that they had some form of cancer and they had, say, six months to live, and the people died right on schedule. And an autopsy post-mortem revealed that they didn't have any kind of cancer, but they believed they were going to die at a certain time, and they did. That's a nocebo effect. There, there's also illnesses that can result from different kinds of spiritual activity. Maybe uh, this may relate to ancestors for peoples who hold that their ancestors are around them. Maybe non-human creatures, demigods, gods, or God. And all of these uh, aspects of, of spirituality can lead to either health or in our, our concern here with illness, where interaction with the spiritual realm results in illness. Oftentimes the appropriate remedies, just while we're on it, also relate to this, where the appropriate interaction with the spiritual realm will lead to health. And so that's another aspect of this, is that the, 
uh, there's oftentimes a fair amount of symmetry between the cause of illness and the cause of health. Lastly, we have a category that's uh, culturally related that looks like it should be biological, but it's really not. And this is the category of biological processes and how we categorize those. So, uh, th and th this category can actually be a fairly entertaining one to discuss because once you get onto it, you realize that there's all kinds of great and funny things that are, you know, every eight year old has a great time with. This includes uh, is passing gas a disease? Is this an illness? In some communities it is, in other communities it's a great compliment. Belching, is this an illness? Is this a problem that needs to be addressed? Or is this something that's to be encouraged? It's a way of thanking the chef or something like that. Uh, uh, how often does one need to have a bowel movement? Many cultures hold that you should have a bowel movement at a certain periodicity. Maybe that's once a day, maybe that's once every three days, maybe that's once a week. And if you don't follow that schedule, you are not healthy and therefore need to be treated. Um, this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg of a large category. And if you think about it, uh, I'm sure everyone has some of these that they grew up learning. And you grew up being taught that these are the way the world works and that these are biological processes. But the simple fact of the matter is, is that as a biologist, I can assure you, almost every one of these is a cultural interpretation of the biological world and not really a biological fact. The third category that we want to deal with is how cultures vary in determining the resolution of illness. And so there's, there's three main ways that people address this. The first is a pharmacological approach. You, you take some kind of a medication, it could be a plant, it could be some processed medicine, and when you use that, it directly results in the resolution of the illness and so you don't need to do anything else that is the key thing that resolves illness the second strategy is one of an environmental approach where you change something in your environment and that then results in a change in your health status so by changing the environment around you you become more healthy and the the clear underlying assumption in that is that it was a change in the environment that led to your becoming unhealthy and now you need to go reverse that process uh, the, the, th the third way to resolve an illness is to use a cultural strategy. This, this could involve addressing any of the aspects of the cultural environment. It could involve recognizing that there was a particular phenomena or cosmological event that happened and therefore doing the opposite of that. It could involve taking back the kind of control that you've granted to somebody else. It could involve undoing a nocebo or placebo effect. Um, it could involve uh, satiating some particular spiritual problem and resolving it. Um, or it could involve restoring appropriate bodily processes um, so that you resume positive health. When we consider the uh, issue of health and wellness, uh, this is another aspect that's highly variable because what people actually feel is healthy is really different from one community to another. Um, in some communities, being really thin and uh, underfed is considered to be very healthy. In other communities, being excessively overweight is considered to be very healthy. Now, obviously these cannot both be true, uh, but they each can be true within a cultural context that says this is the way the world works. And, and you can imagine there's a large number of other aspects where cultures differ on what they consider to be healthy or unhealthy. And so the, the aspects that usually relate to maintaining healthiness or main, maintaining wellness include dietary considerations. Every human on earth has to eat. Diet is clearly related to health care and every culture recognizes this relationship and the role that diet plays within each society is important, although the specifics of it tend to vary a lot and sometimes cultures are uh, hold opposite opinions on issues. In many societies there's a, a large concern that's taken up with foods that are medicinal. Within our society we have some kinds of foods that are medicinal. If you think about it you'll think of certain kinds of things that you're fed when you're ill. This could include things like orange juice, chicken soup, and other, other kinds of foods that 
are traditionally given to people when they are not healthy. The implication is that if you eat these foods, they will help you become well. And so these are medicinal foods by definition. In some societies, medicinal foods are eaten uh, all year round uh, as a means of preventative medicine. Uh, or they may be eaten seasonally. So for instance, many peoples who live in areas where there's a monsoon season, so they have cycles of wet and dry, and there's a parallel cycle of mosquitoes that transmit diseases such as malaria, people will have certain foods that they eat during malaria season, and sometimes these are shown to be effective treatments to prevent malarial infections. And so, uh, medicinal foods are a fairly common property that, that humans have. Third category is actually medicines themselves. And these would be things that people don't think of as foods, but they rather consume specifically to treat an illness or to prevent an illness. And, and these are different than, than either the basic foods or medicinal foods. And then lastly, there's a question of cultural normality. And cultural normality really varies a lot. And perhaps giving an example will help to make this a little bit clear. Uh, within much of globalized society, uh, individuals who are rather outgoing and could even be categorized as mild to moderate manic patients um, have a role. They're oftentimes incorporated into society as politicians or used car salesmen or other kinds of roles that allow a little bit of uh, megalomania to run amok and yet still be considered to be uh, satisfactory. And these people are marginal, but they're still considered normal within society. Now, in many small traditional societies, somebody who has a rather large ego is not very well accepted and is definitely considered to be abnormal, and they just don't fit in. And so, in a smaller society, somebody who's kind of got this big ego uh, would be considered to be ill. Within our society, they're actually considered to be a world leader. The reverse is true in some other categories. So within globalized society, if we have a person who uh, sees things that other people don't see, they talk to individuals that others don't see or hear, uh, we might categorize them as schizophrenic. However, in some traditional societies, this person is considered to be gifted and has an insight that the rest of us uh, are just lacking. And so what is considered to be normal and what's considered to be abnormal, what's considered to be something that needs to be treated and what's considered to be something that doesn't need to be treated, varies across cultures. So it's really important to take this into account uh, if we want to step into one culture or another and ask about their medicinal plants and the way that they're used. because. The kinds of things that people are going to want to be treating within a culture are not uniform. And so you have to be careful when you come in that you don't take your preconceived ideas of what is health and what is wellness and what is illness and cast those on to other people and expect them to have treatments that will work for, for the kinds of things you're concerned about.